So I, um, I call this, it's really strange, I think it must have converted, but it, it, there's a little thing down there. I call this the eye of the storm syndrome. And I was trained then as an architect, and then for the last 25 years, I've been working in the developing world. And uh, I've been working in the developing world by taking, first working for the UN and the World Bank for a decade, and then for the last 24 years, just taking students from the frontiers, of the, from the outside, from the developed world of Europe and the United States, and then taking them out of their comfort zone to the developing world so they can take them out of their comfort zone and see themselves in the eyes of the outside. And uh, that kind of decontextualizing of stepping outside your skin to be able to see yourself better has been at the heart of my mission. And I'm doing it that way because when I came to the United States and to Spain, it was Spain was, of course, embracing much more of who I was, but I felt like there was a kind of eye of the storm syndrome. And I don't know if how many of you have been in the eye of a storm, but I've been in several eye of storms now because I'm in such strange places all over the world. But in the eye of the storm, there's an extraordinary sense of calm. Like you see the sky is blue above you and everything seems very still because there's no wind movement. But you look at the horizon and all hell is breaking loose. And so what I realized coming from Latin America in exile to the first world was that we actually um, were suffering the consequences of a way of life and a, and a way of living in this world that was affecting us and in a sense making us victims or remaking our lives against our will in a way because of the, to maintain a kind of way of life and a way of being in the world. So I, in my way, as an educator, when I started doing this, I started taking students from the developed, the first world, out to the edge so they could see the world from the eyes of us who were being affected by the shift in the way we live in the world. So it was a, both an act of cultural and environmental sustainability in a way, sustainability in its kind of most basic form in a sense that this could not be sustained. We can't have an eye of the storm where 5% of the world remains well positioned and the rest of the world gets remade. And of course, you know, the reason we're well remade is that we, we're very active human beings. You know, the humans are continuously building and as a species, you know, we can't sit still. And then often that kind of stillness is a contradiction of communities that, like the communities that I serve, who have traditionally lived in a, in a close relationship to the land. And um, I'm just throwing this slide up because this is, a, this is a slide of three communities that we've been working for 24 years, one of our earliest subjects. And there's two, three villages here, central Mexico, Sivac, the industrial zone, in which in the middle of them, like a, like a UFO, landed 180 American and European pharmaceutical companies. And then for the next 25 years, we started in the 70s, the population grew at somewhere between 8 to 12 percent. As Mexicans came out of the agricultural fields, loose because they could no longer compete with agribusiness, and then slowly came to work for the pharmaceutical companies. So there's two root problems here. On one side, People are leaving a, a sustainable way of living that they have had for thousands of years, and they're leaving them to work in industries which have no context in their culture, and which they are dissociated from the value since they are not the clients of the wor work or the product that gets there. So people left the countryside and then created informal settlements, which is the nice word we use these days for squatter communities and then slowly overwhelmed what had been the three villages here, all which dated back to over 2,000 years ago, to the point that today it's hard to see what remained of the original culture. So in that displacement, and I, this is a, actually a photograph, actually about 10 kilometers away from there, still kind of maintains traditions, and here what you're seeing is people drawing straw on end to make uh, petates, which is a mat, like a tatami, Japanese tatami mat, and they weave it in a cycle, and they put it down, and this area has woven these tata, petates in a, in a kind of organic pattern that changes every lunar year, 
and um, they've been weaving these patterns for about 7,800 years. They're this kind of cohesive, continuous relationship to the land. And this picture is from the south of Mexico, and so, which is another extraordinary community. And so I fell in love with these kind of places. This is the kind of places I came from, South America. And in a way, they became my cause to try to see how I would make these communities survive. And since then, we've been working. We've done, we've had 95 major program areas in 24 years. We've done about 29,000 buildings in different forms throughout the world. And um, through this organization, this organization that I head called the Basic Initiative, it now combines 26, 25, 26 universities in Europe, Latin America, I mean, in Europe, United States, and Asia. And it has taken us to everywhere. And this range of solutions has been extraordinary. We've been collaborating with Arab and Ladakh in that school that Simon um, Cameron was talking about, which actually, that toilet does not work, I should tell you. It's very stinky. <laughs> Even though we were involved in part of the engineering of it. But anyway. But the, the reason that toilet doesn't work is part of our challenge. Because, and Arab will very gladly tell you this, we are, we, the, the toilet was over-engineered and the people who were getting the toilet were never explained how the toilet worked. In the sense that the technology was transferred to them, but people didn't, weren't given the knowledge of how to make the toilet work. So it's non-functioning now. And we've been trying to make it work. And by educating the local people as to how the biological processes work. So at the heart of what we're doing is, is thinking of students, and what I'm trying to do is make civic environmentalists out of students. So it's a kind of collect, collection of two principles that emerged out of Greece. The idea of civicness, the idea of becoming part of a community which had rights and responsibilities, but also environmentalism, which implies both that we have been given certain rights to land and resources, but with, with that, complicit with that, is that we have to take care of it and be good stewards of it. And so, to create that, I create a kind of collaboration between students and community, which creates the work together. So it changes the, the game plan. The person that you meet out in the city, out in the developing world, doesn't look like your typical client. It looks like that other 95% of the world that we normally don't address, but we might meet in the panaderia or somewhere like that. And it's these people that we collaborate with to come up with pro solutions to problems that actually are so dominant that they actually are everywhere in the world we live, but don't get addressed by the knowledge we carry as architects and practitioners. And the goal of it is to create praxis, this kind of idea of reflection that also comes from the Greek that we reflect on our actions. So I take you, my students out of this, say, to bring you back with a kind of new sense of who you are and why you might be doing architecture. So just very quickly taking some projects and to show you what the stories are like. <clears throat> These are women. These women have actually been, the, she's the daughter of this mother who has actually been part of our housing project, or no, sorry, housing, our school project. And she is, what she's doing is she's cooking outside of the school because she is not allowed to go inside and cook for her children. But they're worried about the food. They will go out because what happens, the kids go out with their money in the middle of the day and go buy potato chips and Coca-Cola. And they're worried about the nutrition. So their reaction is to cook and they take turns cooking outside the school. And as they take turns, you know, they provide both a small income for them but a better nutrition for the kids. And out of that, which Cameron was showing, grew this process of doing solar kitchens. And these kitchens, we negotiated with the, with the schools that we had built a generation before and then grew to other schools. The kitchens brought the women into the schools and actually opened the doors to the schools to make them more community-based schools. And by bringing the mothers in, they took on a significant role, just like the teachers in the lives of the students. And as well as the fact that these schools these kitchens were totally off the grid. They cooked by solar energy, they captured solar energy, they actually were naturally illuminated, they caught, captured their own water, the entire system. So they provided a model of how their own kitchens could be developed. And working, because I bring students of many disciplines, not just architects, because I feel architects have to learn to work with economists, lawyers, you know, doctors, et cetera. We ran a whole series of seminars as we built these for over three years, and we taught the women how to deal, how to change their 
things to create greater nutrition, or how to build little, little solar dishes like this from scrap metal, or how to capture rainwater. So that by the time we finished, these were the women that followed me to the building of the giant waste treatment plant, because they realized that even being as radical as they were getting, there was still waste in the thing. So here you're actually seeing the condenser mirror. Rather than using, as we developed in the early, with the Germans earlier on, with beautiful little light smears, we, we're using the cheapo 25 cent, you know, the 10 euro, I mean 10 euro, <laughs> the 25 10 euro uh, little vanity mirrors you find in the market. So we are creating the cheap version of that condenser uh, heating system. Now, one thing that happened in this, which we didn't expect, but actually transformed the program, and this is what I think is so extraordinary about working in the field like this, is that the entire thing became a kind of community center that remained open late at night, because now it had solar energy to drop into. And it became dramatically and radically so a lantern on the hill, because the first one was so dramatically placed, and it sat here as a community center in the school built by, with us, with the community, overlooking the power plant, which fed the 180 pharmaceutical plant, plants that had imposed themselves in the landscape. And what you see in the horizon here are the lights of 1.8 million people living out there who have actually stolen the electricity from this power plant to feed themselves. And yet up on the hill, it's a kind of symbol, it's a new community, new kind of school, which is a symbol of an energy independence or a different path for architecture. For my students to understand that the principal thing about architecture sometimes is not the architectural act, but what makes the architectural act possible, that that is fundamentally what is making these people's lives, transforming these people's lives, the fact that they are now achieving um, financial independence is extraordinary. Anyway, I'm gonna end actually on a project we just have been working. We were there from the very beginning in Katrina. We've been collaborating with uh, Architecture for Humanity on this. And actually, uh, you know, it was a devastating thing. And of course, it's the kind of thing that we're gonna increasingly have to get used to because it's one of the symptoms that the Earth is telling us it's, <laughs> things aren't going well because, you know, we have today, at least in the south of the United States, five times as many storms per year as we had at the beginning of the 20th century. And as the Earth loses its environment, biological capacity to moderate the climate, it'll be increasingly worse. So, but what it uncovers for a lot of Americans was the fact that there was incredible poverty in the United States. And not only poverty, but incredible inequality in the South. And I went there um, not having really ever visited New Orleans before, and I was just shocked, because we have been working in squatter communities in India, Mexico, Africa, many places, and I had never seen such abject poverty. So abject poverty because those people had no hope that the system would ever deal with their problems. Because as opposed to that Indian who's working in his village and trying to make his work better, or that group of women in Mexico who all knows that they have a collective conscience that can get them there, these people feel disfranchised and they feel like there's no recourse to improve their poverty. So we actually went out there and the government had frozen all buildings. So we were trying to figure out how could we make ourselves useful. And some woman came out to me and said, you know, in 1964, when the last big storm came through, my mother rode us up to high ground, and then we went and took our house apart, and we built a new house on high ground. And I thought, there has to be some way to begin to supply people who want to rebuild their homes. So we started this massive salvage operation, it grew small and then grew bigger and bigger, till now it's about eight city blocks in New Orleans, and it took out contracts and scavenging all the old buildings of New Orleans. And slowly, it, people can go in there. If you drive up in a Mercedes, we'll charge you five euros per square meter for your wood. If you drive up in an old pickup truck, you'll pay only 50 cents to that one. So we have a sliding social scale here. And the thing is that it's promoting, it has created a center which has become a center for the Lower East Night Worth. It sits at the crux of three of the most affected communities. And it's become a center not only for going by your scrap and hanging out and talking about the beautiful things that have been scavenged, you know, some of them which are 300 year old windows and things like that. But it also has become a center for the community. And we found that the first element we had to add last year after we expanded the whole thing was actually a community center. So it's become a, this hybrid structure which talks about how 
architecture is transforming itself as all these new social and environmental and economic programs and necessities are having to be addressed by buildings we have never imagined before. So it's making us try, attempting to shift the paradigms by which we have guided ourselves to think about where the built world is going. And I think it's in the extreme at the edges of places like this that we're beginning to encounter and realize where that is. And so we came up with a thing, we scavenged stuff, then we realized we need to create more economic potential. We started making furniture out of the scrap, beautiful wood. This is cypress, wet cypress and pine tree. This is the wood the Japanese worship, you know. And there was, every building was built out of planks they would have made masterpieces in Japan, but it was hit inside the walls. So we decided to celebrate that by making tables. 200,000 families, 200,000 people have left the thing, and now we, um, and, and will not return. So we have a program with Oprah Winfrey paying that every family that leaves New Orleans gets a table, which is made of the wood that they, of the place they went, because eating has been central to culture, so they'll eat on a table, which part, a vessel of their past culture. And we have found other ways to use the salvage. The, the FEMA trailers are terrible. They're contaminated things. We have started a process by which families can come and get free material. And we then send architects and builders out there to build um, sheds for them, sheds that are more dignified. And then also to build housing, which unfortunately here we're realizing now to meet federal standards are four to five meters off the ground, but actually are creating a new model of living for these people in the South, which they're moving away from contamination, away from the culture, beginning to understand that buildings can have a passive approach and which can, which can be a new form of expression that they, that they weren't used to. All of a sudden they're realizing, the woman here started crying when we finished the house and said, I never believed anybody would make me a beautiful house. I didn't feel like I deserved one. I thought, my God, you're a human being. You deserve the most beautiful house on earth. Anyway, so, as I was saying, I have my students reflect. And in the process of reflection, what we do is I ask them, and they make films, they reflect through films, they reflect through photography, but I ask them to keep a journal. And I'm, what I'm gonna show you is a series of kind of things that came out of one journal that I collected before I lectured. I came to Barcelona, and, they, and they're actually come out of the journal as the student. I'm just picking them out out of 200 pages we wrote as he went to, to work with us with the Yaqui. And so he's asking himself, what was our ecological footprint in Mexico? This is a kind of praxis that we, I hope that every student goes through as he goes through the program and comes back and then realizes what he wants to do with architecture. And he, then he asks himself, which I think is extraordinary, who or what do we have an obli obligation to serve? You know, like the client, which is our traditional role. Community is, do we really serve not just the client but the larger community? Do we serve clean air and water? I mean, things that are, don't belong to anybody but are the legacy of humanity. Or fresh food, you know? Like, you know, the potential of the earth to produce other things than just have a house on it. And how are the interdependencies accounted for? How do we decide how each of those things are, because they're not single and isolated things, but they're all interconnected. And the woman, it was really wonderful woman, she asked them, so you just built me a dry composting toilet. Do you have one at home and how do you like it? And the guy said, you know, of course he didn't, you know, so. And of course he had to then think, you know, why don't I have the composting toilet? You know, why am I preaching this in the developing world and not carrying this back home? And this is kind of the reflection that I'm hoping to create by pulling the students out there, engaging, making global citizens and coming back to make it. And so what do you do with that knowledge once you have it? Does knowledge equal responsibility. In other words, do we need to begin to shift the paradigm of architecture? Do we need to begin to have a code like doctors have? If you look at the code of conduct of architects, there's nothing in the code of conduct that says, you know, we shall do no harm, like the medical code says, which has been there since the beginning of medicine. Does the architect need to shift the way they think and the role they play to become an advocate? for something else that's not there, but should be there. And um, I picked this one out, because I knew my students would like it, so I'm throwing it at you too, but I think it's one of the most poignant things that came out of the Katrina project, which has grown to immense scale now. And it's actually, I don't know if you can tell, but <laughs> it's actually the ends of cigarettes, they're the filters of cigarettes, and they've been burned to different degrees of blackness. 
And um, what this student has done is, is actually he has sorted them by color and he's done a self-portrait. And the cigarettes come from the ground of all the meetings that were held in New Orleans to come up with a federal plan of rescue. And, it's, and he termed it a portrait in, in frustration. It's a kind of a self-portrait of frustration. And, and really, it's a kind of a challenge to us because in a way, as architects, sometimes we, we ca catch ourselves in inactivity because we think that we can't do you know, the things that we know should be done. But even the smallest act can actually begin to begin to be, can be the beginning of change and actually can have extraordinary ripple effects as we've experienced in the developing world. So I guess my challenge to you and I guess my support for what the last group was doing is that don't stand on the side and not be involved because, you know, we have incredible knowledge as architects and designers and the world needs it because we are both the greatest part of the problem but also potentially the ones that can solve it. So anyway, thank you.